I want to start with the sort of early days of PRIO and your involvement in it. And uh, in those pioneering times, if I can use the expression, people came into the field from all sorts of different you know, backgrounds and experiences, intellectual traditions. So what was yours and how did you actually first get involved in the field? That, that is um, a question that requires different types of answers. Mm -hmm. You must remember that I was born in 1933, mm -hmm. which means that I and my generation of people were people who had experienced war. Mm -hmm. Norway was occupied for five countries. Our parents had been in the resistance. Mm -hmm. We had played our little part as children at war. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Germans occupied all our schools. We moved from one school to another. We had classes in dining rooms and garages. Mm. Uh, so we had a war experience. Mm. And when the war ended, it was very much on our mind, how can this be prevented? Never mm. again. And added on that jubilant feeling of peace having come at last was the terrible series of photographs that came of the devastation mm. because Oslo was with a few exceptions Oslo was not bombed mm. uh, the Germans had a problem with us because you know in their image we were more Aryan than they were right. so we didn't experience the atrocities uh, of the Poles for instance mm. uh, or the Ukrainians mm. but we saw that Jews in our neighborhood disappeared mm -hmm. um, and and we had strong feeling of war as something that had to be prevented. Mm. We also lived in a, and live in a political climate where conflict is natural, necessary, and with the management of conflict is the big thing. Mm. The, the ability of uh, communities and institutions to absorb, transform, resolve conflicts in a peaceful but fair and re reasonably predictable way mm. is important. So that was, in a way, the context. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, and the short answer to your question is, of course, that I came through teachers educate, teacher training huh. and sociological studies, mm -hmm. and I had had the good fortune to accompany Johann Galtung to the United States, where he was an ass uh, assistant professor at Columbia University. Yes. So I had the privilege of studying under Lars Osfeldt and Merton and Saigud oh. and Selditch mm -hmm. and all the big mm -hmm. stars in sociology mm -hmm. at the time, mm -hmm. and could come home and do my research in the field of education, mm -hmm. uh, but also with a, the other specialization was in conflict and mm -hmm. conflict theory. Mm -hmm. Lou Coser's and Simmel's work, as yeah. you know. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, and I didn't realize that you'd been through teacher training because that was my introduction to the intellectual exactly. life as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm. No, my, my parents were teachers. Oh. They were natural science teachers. Uh -huh. And um, I had a feeling, partly inspired by, by UNESCO, yeah. that peace education would be important. Mm. And I wanted to enter that field and be a legitimate teacher. Mm -hmm. so, and to be a legitimate and legalized teacher in the Norwegian elementary system, mm. you had to go through teacher training ah, as a separate. Mm. That is now slightly changed, mm. but there was, that was a requirement at the time. Yeah. And, uh, and there was, were there separate colleges for yes. uh, teaching yes. for teaching teachers to teach? Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah. Very like the British system in yeah. those days. Yeah. But as you say, it's all it's changed so, it's now. It's changing, yeah. Mm, okay. So uh, you actually were at Columbia in the early 50s or the late 40s? In the, in, no, in the mid. Uh, in the mid and late. Ah, okay. we, no, we actually came in 50, 57, mm -hmm. Johan Galtung and I, and we were married. We had our first child at Columbia mm. and, no. um, uh, and returned to Norway in 59. Okay. Um, Johan had then also, remember also that this was a time of decolonization mm. and the, the legacy of, of Gandhi's nonviolent struggle mm. in India. Mm. Uh, Johan and Arne Ness had already written about um, uh, Gandhi. Mm. the political ethic, ethics of Gandhi. Mm. Uh, and this was part of uh, what we already had. And ah. it was in the aftermath of that that we said, this has to be systematically studied. Mm -hmm. And it was from the outset conflict and peace research. 
with us. Around about that time, there were, there were these two concepts, really. There was sort of conflict and peace research. And you mm -hmm. seem to have indicated that here in your minds they were married. Yeah. In a lot of other places, they were sort of treated as somewhat separate and in some cases uh, not competitive, but uh, at least the peace researchers would always uh, look down on me as a conflict researcher and mm -hmm. say things like, oh, well, you know, you, you're just a so-called scientists with no heart, and we used to look at them and say, you, you, you know, you're, you, utopian. You're, you're utopian and you're, you, you have a lot of heart but no science. Yeah. Was, was, there, was that division over yes. here at all? No, there was no such division. Mm -hmm. I think we, uh, as I said, our context was mm -hmm. one of considering conflict as natural and necessary. Mm -hmm. yeah. The ho only thing was, as, as Gandhi had exemplified, yeah. how you handle conflict mm -hmm. to obtain a fair process and result. Mm. So in 59 you were back here and yeah. at that point you started to systematize and institutionalize. Yeah. How did that come about? Well, we, we had then already a fairly well-established Institute of Social Research, which exists to this day mm. and uh, where unfortunately the pioneers have died, but uh, where you will find people who, who carry that on. Mm. It was well established, it had good contacts in different countries, including to the US. Mm. Paul Lassesfeld had been there frequently. Ah, uh -huh. uh, several other people, Merton has been lecturing mm. there, and uh, of course the people in um, political, political science also. Mm. This was an interdisciplinary institute because sociology did, didn't exist in Oslo really? at that time. Mm -hmm. no. Mm. Uh, so we, we established sociology as a discipline mm. at, at the university mm. um, and social research uh, as an independent institute. Mm -hmm. Mm. And we were, the, the board of that institute decided that they would expand by having a section or a division, a unit on conflict and peace uh -huh. research. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to do systematic study of conflict at all levels, from the interpersonal mm -hmm. to the, um, if you wish, the, the global level. Mm -hmm. uh, and we wanted to have a systematic study of peace conditions for peace, mm -hmm. um, making it perhaps less utopian, more tangible, yeah. since that was after all the aim, for instance, of the UN. Mm. And the UN is, uh, was and is, and the first Secretary General was a Norwegian, as mm. you know, mm. uh, a very important institution in Norwegian politics. Mm. Yeah. And so the Institute set up this department, division... Of conflict and, and peace, peace research. Okay. And it was only after when we had established the field in a way mm. and created both methods, had a reasonable amount of output, that we dared mm. uh, to, to say it is peace research. Ah. And it was when we, it was in the transition from being part of the Institute of Social Research to becoming an independent. Mm -hmm. Institute. Around about that time, several people have remarked that the the the, the term peace yes. was a slightly dangerous one to employ. Uh, did you find that in Norway as well? Well, we struggled to avoid it. Really? Yeah. Well, what <laughs> we struggled to avoid it being, you know, a four-letter word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, tried to make peace respectable mm. by analyzing it mm. in a way that people could uh, could grasp and to this day I think that we were helped in that effort by uh, the great Italian social reformer Danilo Dolce really? who was a follower of, of Gandhi yeah. uh -huh. and he said we must stop to think of peace as only the absence of war mm. mm -hmm. and violence how, however important that is it's a sine qua non mm. but Peace is not only the absence of war, it is the opposite. Mm. And then he said, now what is it that characterizes war? And he said, what would be the opposite? Characteristic ah, by characteristic. Okay. War is destructive. It is, peace is constructive. Mm -hmm. War is polarized. Peace is mm. pluralist, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And went on like that. And I think it gives a totally different image of what peace is about, mm. that it is active, 
that it de relates to what people do every day. Mm. And it gave people an identification with peace as something that really was part of everyday life. Mm. Peace was normal. Yeah, yeah. As Ed Said has noted. You yes. Know. Uh, oh, it was, um, it was from Dolce that that, that, that originally well, came. As, but... as, as I remember yeah, it, uh -huh. that, that particular mm. pedagogical approach mm. came from him. And I always refer to him also yeah. because I think he deserves to be remembered. Yeah, oh, indeed he does. But I think that you know, my students certainly have a, the impression that uh, that idea of what they call positive peace comes from here, comes from Oslo. Yes, we had, we had introduced negative and positive peace. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But uh, it's a question of uh, communicating it, isn't it? Mm. Yes, it, it is, because okay. most people, I think, still have the idea that peace simply means you're not killing each other, which yeah, is... exactly. You know, with, uh, and, you know, baseline, we, you but, may yeah. have seen in the Journal of uh, Peace Research... Uh, which helped to establish it. it was also that we didn't want to compete with the Journal of Conflict Resolution from our good friends in Ann Arbor. Uh, uh -huh. So we said, let's establish it as a, as a slightly different journal. Mm. Let's have it light blue to relate it to the UN. Mm. Uh, oh, let that us, was why you chose the color. Yes, yes. Mm. And let us have the... Um, and I, I, I drew... I made the drawing for the circle with the three people, which was a reference to, to Zimmel's conflict theory. Yeah, yeah. So Michigan, Columbia, where else? Because in those days, uh, you know, in, whether you think about peace centers or conflict centers, there weren't no, it, many it of was, them. Uh, there weren't many. Mm. No, we linked up with the, with the, with the Dutch. Mm -hmm. You know, who had uh, a, a center for what they called polymology. Yes, that's right. I can yeah, never spell Bat it. Yeah, Rolling, Polymology, right. yes, Rolling. Right. And his background was, of course, from international law. He had mm -hmm. been, if I remember correctly, one of the judges in the trials right. in Asia mm -hmm. of the I, Japanese yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, Indonesia and um, Yes, so on. he seems to have been very important, but Extreme. unfortunately is no longer with us. No. So, mm. okay. But you, you might meet some of his students of course if you go there or a person who like me was among the first group of peace researchers and went into politics mm. okay. um, let me sort of tease you a bit more on this business about peace as a concept because um, um, I mean, in the 1950s uh, even I remember that it, it, it had all sorts of overtones of being, I mean, it was the Cold War. Yeah, and, it, was, and it was a Soviet gimmick. Mm. Yeah, well, did, did, uh, did course, you have problems with that? Yes, because our, our background was in the early, late 40s, early 50s, mm. from uh, in, in student politics, yeah. where we struggled to insist that it was across conflict borders that mm. you needed to have contact. Mm -hmm. And, of course, with the, with the notion that you should, should isolate Eastern Europe, um, that you shouldn't trade with them, mm, you shouldn't yeah. talk to them. We felt that that, that was totally wrong. We mm. didn't want dissociative, but we said associative politics. Mm -hmm. And without that, uh, all the things that are referred to in UNESCO's preamble, mm. you remember? Yes. Or yeah. in the wines, in, minds in of in men. The minds of men, yeah. Uh, that we minds took of that, men. Yeah, men. We took that seriously and mm. said, if we are going to prevent the misunderstanding, the lack of information, prejudices, etc., mm. we have to meet each other. Mm. We have to hear and see. And we tried also to convince people in the West who were critical of our liaisons that <laughs> these people live in dictatorships, and we knew what that meant. Mm. They are not able to voice. Perhaps we can go to their conferences and we can be their voice mm. uh, and not make them victims yeah. of disinformation mm. from the regime. Mm -hmm. We also insisted that these people and the Poles, I mean, every sixth Pole had died in the war. Mm. The, the Russians had died in tens mm. of millions. Mm. Yeah. They had every reason to long for peace. Mm. It was a genuine, deep felt thing that shouldn't, in a way, be purely politicized. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 
Well, I think um, you might have had a relatively easier time of doing that in Norway than anybody in the rest of Europe, because I remember the time, those times in Britain, mm -hmm. there was a feeling that we were un under siege at yeah. the time, yeah. and anybody... Oh, well, but we were, mm. uh, but... <laughs> um, we had, of course, many people in Norway who had been prisoners of war who had mm -hmm. been in concentration camp who now were in positions of power and they had one they were almost obsessed with the idea like you are now with 9-11 never again the 9th of April yeah. when the Germans occupied Norway hmm? mm -hmm. never again the 9th of April we have to be allied yeah. in NATO we have to have strong defense we have to etc etc yeah. uh, and of course they were skeptical to say the least mm. and they kept track of uh, what we were doing and uh, we had some upheavals where they accused us of being infiltrators on behalf of communists mm. in the mid in the early 50s mm. um, and uh, w we insisted that we were not that whatever we did was totally open mm. and that we carried with us into peace research where we said our research will be based only on open sources mm -hmm so that we have the full right to also disseminate openly. Mm. And we had people from the military establishment coming to our seminars, taking notes, knowing who we were, where we went, who came to visit, mm. um, from East and West. And um, it was the only, openness was the only way in which we could mm. protect us against yeah. those accusations. Mm. Mm. I think I, I can say that none of us were, were communists. Perhaps that was a mistake some of us should have been. And of course what happened later was with Marxist-Leninism Leninism coming into like a wave after 68 mm. Uh, mm. in the universities. Yes. This was not the case uh, at the outset. At the beginning. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, you said something earlier on that I'd like to go back to, yeah. which uh, is intriguing, because you said that you had the idea in those early days that you had to create a, f a field or a discipline before you could create the institution. And you thought that you'd succeeded in, in, in creating an acceptable field, or a res I think I wouldn't say a field as much as a research program. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We said, we said, and remember, this was. I don't know if you have read the early works of of Professor Arne Ness. No, no I haven't. No. I but, must um, admit. Yeah, but uh, he was um, what some later have accused him of a positivist. But I mean, mm. we were extremely empirical. Yeah. We were try we tried to be precise in the concepts we launched, mm. and these two things together, with the openness, mm. we felt was enough to establish some credibility yeah. for the research program. Mm -hmm. And I think that was successful. Mm. We established an image uh, among those concerned that this was serious, it was reliable, mm. we could be cooperated yeah. with. I think I should mention that my background was also partly in the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Ah, okay. And the strong women I met there, mm. uh, some from um, uh, then living behind the Iron Curtain, who mm. had been active in the, before the war. Yeah. Uh, some from both sides of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, mm -hmm. conflict mm. Um, and with a strong liaison to all the UN system mm -hmm. and I was actually the observer for the League at the UN at the, UN. At the ah. time I studied. Mm -hmm. uh, so through the, the League I got this understanding of the peace movement not only being for peace but for ways of institutionalizing conflict resolution mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. through the League of Nations and then to the United Nations. Mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, it, it was the whole issue of, of arms, the arms race, mm -hmm. the, the uh, dis disarmament issues, the, the horrendous investments in, in arms, 
the mutually assured destruction mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and all of that. We, mm -hmm. we explored public opinion on it, uh, but we also wanted to see now what are the economics in this. Mm -hmm. And of course, inspired by Eisenhower's famous oh, reference. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as you may have noticed in the uh, early list uh, of uh, publications from Frio, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, with Emile Benoit, uh, uh, the uh, yes. Uh, economics of, of arms. The economics and, uh, of yeah. uh, arms, arms uh, control oh. and disarmament. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. And that was replicated some 10, 15 years uh, afterwards. Mm. Uh, then we related to uh, Robert Jung, who had been present when, yes, when the, the nuclear explosion mm -hmm, was yeah. and wrote about the, yes, the future. Bright, brighter than a thousand suns, yeah, I exactly, think that was his yes. book, wasn't it? And, and we said, well, we have to relate to the past to, to see what can historians tell us. Mm -hmm. We have to relate to the present, what is empirically now going on. Mm. But we also have to, to relate to the future. What do we want and how mm. do we get there? Mm. Uh, and of course, uh, Robert Jung was, was very keen to establish the field of futurology. Futurology. As, as, mm -hmm. And in a way, it was similar to what we did with mm. making peace researchable. Mm. He said futurology shouldn't only be utopias, mm. uh, important and mm. interesting as they are, and particularly the dystopias should mm. be studied, but, yeah. but let's see, what can we foretell? Yeah. For, yeah. What can we extrapolate? Mm. What can we uh, aim for and say, now, if this is where we want to go, which are the countdowns or yes. whatever. Yeah. Now, Lise took that up very strongly yeah. and made it a sort of central part of her, her training and her, um, and her uh, work with um, looking at conflicts. Uh, she would always argue, let us start thinking 20 years ahead and then yeah. ask how we get there. Exactly. If we want to, and that's yeah. sort of directly as a And I tried that. to do a similar thing mm -hmm. for, for Women's International League, mm -hmm. where, where, uh, with reference to the Palestinian-Israeli mm -hmm. conflict. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but, um, but I think, I think we have helped a process of keeping the UN and the UN ideals alive. Mm including in peacekeeping operations which have been under pressure but which I think are now reappearing yeah, yeah. since pre-empty wars and regime change has not been so successful, hmm? <laughs> to say the least. Um, that's putting it mildly. Yeah, but that's putting it mildly, mm. but I, I, I think we have managed to, um, uh, to keep some thinking about peace being possible mm. alive. Okay. Um, we have substantiated it. I think we have been uh, instrumental in uh, supporting what, for instance, Butrus Butrus Ghali could put into his agenda for peace, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, where the whole notion of the dynamics, you know, was uh, uh, described yeah. in detail, mm -hmm. and who could play what sort of role mm -hmm. in the different Mm. Faces uh, of of conflict dynamics. Mm. I've often wondered who had an input into that document because it, a lot of the a lot of the I bits of agenda for peace. Uh, what I have learned, and when I say I'm a process person, mm. is that success has many fathers and mothers. <laughs> Failure is an orphan. Oh yes, huh? yes, I think that's and, right. Uh, I think there there are many who who contribute to that. I, mm. in a small way, uh, went. Uh, it, into politics, and mm. I could carry things from my research background mm. into politics. I went to serve at the UN, I could bring it there. Mm. I became a member of UNESCO's executive board in the late mm. 80s and early 90s. Uh, I could help defining the culture of peace mm -hmm. concept, yeah. drawing on all that I had from my peace research mm. background. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think it, I could use it in, in, when I served in UNDP and uh, we established um, first a small group of scholarly-minded colleagues mm. called the Poverty Group and 
then arrived Mabu Bulhak, and we managed in UNDP to launch the highly successful Human Development Report, mm. which I think has, has endeavoured to, to shift from the World Bank image of per capita economic growth to the human development mm. paradigm. Yeah. Uh, is, so I think there, there are many processes uh, where you could say we can claim some, shall we call it, genetic impact mm -hmm. rather than uh, yeah. just parenthood totally. <laughs> hmm? I just want to sort of end up by going back to Prio in the world and maybe not just Prio but you know, the, uh, the way the network which you've described in Scandinavia grew to be a network sort of throughout the world. Um, what do you think were the most effective ways that Prio helped to make the peace research movement an international movement? I mean, uh, IPRA was obviously one way. IPRA was one way, UNESCO was one mm, way. Mm -hmm. the, the fact that we managed to bridge across the uh, Iron Curtain, mm. Mm. Uh, which was partly a UNESCO-based uh, opportunity. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think we, we have to be honest and say that it is very much related to Johan Galtung's personal ah. orbiting, mm -hmm. yeah. that he has been at so many university uh, yes, talking yeah. about this mm. and having his own uh, university tours almost. Mm. When I was a member of UNESCO's board, he suddenly arrived with a group of students from, I think, Princeton, who were doing uh, a global excursion, mm. global fieldwork, and mm. came to hear about UNESCO, mm. where the U.S. was at that time not uh, a member. Mm. So it was an interesting thing to meet them mm. and talk mm. about UNESCO in, mm. from that point of view. Mm. Yes. No, I, th I think it is very much related to that, but of course not solely, because mm. he responds to a latent demand or manifest demand mm. at various places. Mm. So you will, you will have to look at the layer of political political science, social science mm. institutions, how they have acted, what the networks mm. are, uh, how actively we from the very first days is interacted with all kinds of conferences, mm. international seminars. Mm. Um, it's, it's the way it works, isn't it? <laughs>